Well, good evening. I'm glad for each one of you are here this evening. We're glad that you've come to share this class, to learn together as we uh, look into God's Word. It's always good to know that the teacher's here before we start. At this point, I can't say that, but uh, we're trusting that uh, he is one's way. We did encounter a, a down tree in the Caledonia area, so I'm supposing that maybe he got tied up in some traffic there and that he'll be here before too long. I'll go ahead and make my uh, few announcements and we'll go ahead and sing a song like I was planning and hopefully he'll be here by the time I'm through with all that. Um, again, we welcome you here. Glad for each one of you that have shown an interest in this class and uh, have made this possible. So many as people sign up and avail themselves to this opportunity that the class becomes a success. So uh, thank you for, for uh, showing interest and your support in this learning opportunity. There are CDs available of each of the classes. You can indicate your desire for those on the sign-in sheet. Um, it is important that you pay attention to that sign-in sheet. Number one, it lets us know that you're here because uh, we do try to keep a record of that. Also, there's opportunity for you to put your email address there. And uh, in this particular case, that will allow us to email you a link to a video recording that we plan to uh, make available. Um, the call-in option is available tonight for those that are interested, and I'm sure there are perhaps a few planning to take advantage of that. But if you're planning to call in tonight and would rather have a video, you can uh, go on with other plans this evening and, Lord willing, watch the video link at a later time. Brother Ken indicates that he'll have that uploaded later this evening or tomorrow. So uh, that is an option. But uh, if your email address is not on the sign-in sheet and you would like that, please put your email address on that so that uh, that can be made available to you. I think that's all I have by way of announcements. Um, again, we're glad for each one that's come out this evening. I think we have enough here to have a nice song service if Brother Leon doesn't show up. I was planning to sing a song at the beginning. We'll sing one, and if he's still not here, we'll maybe sing a second. Turn to uh, number 40 in your little green uh, hymns to be remembered. Number 40. It's always interesting when you have a, a group of men only, or very few ladies, how the singing is going to go. But uh, I know it's usually a blessing to hear a group of men sing together. I trust that will be the case this evening.
by the same this evening. Praise the Lord. We're glad that uh, Brother Leon made it safe and sound. And uh, we're going to turn it over to him at this time. We will uh, take a break around the 8 o'clock mark, sing another song as we reconvene. And then uh, Brother Leon can close as he sees fit from there. So we'll turn it over to you, Brother. Well, good evening and welcome for devotions this evening. We'll begin by turning to the second chronicles. There's many kings in second chronicles. Um, one of the probably not as familiar is uh, one named Asa. In second chronicles 15, the prophet Azariah had come to Asa and had given him a message. I'm going to read uh, 2 Chronicles 15, verse 7 and 8. He said, Be strong, therefore, and let not your hands be weak, for your work shall be rewarded. And when Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Oded, the prophet, he took courage and put away the abominable idols out of all that land of Judah and Benjamin, and out of the cities which he had taken from Mount Ephraim, and renewed the altar of the Lord. That was before the porch of the Lord. There's the beginning of a revival throughout the land, throughout the people, but it didn't last. In the very next chapter, we find that Asa left God and was punished for that. And it's interesting to note that before this prophecy in verse 3 of chapter 15, we read these words. Now for a long time, Israel have been without the true God and without a teaching priest and without law. Asa's son was Jehoshaphat. When Jehoshaphat became king, one of the first things he did was set up teaching priests. Chapter 17. He did several things. And then in verse 7 it says, Therefore, no, no, Chronicles 17, verse 7. Also in the third year of his reign, he sent to his princes, even, well, for some reason I've come with a light here. Yeah, this might be better. In the third year of his reign, he sent to his princes, even to ben Heli and to Obadiah, and to Zechariah, and to Nishmael, and to Michael, and to teach in the cities of Judah. And with them he sent Levites, the names of the number of Levites that he sent. And then with them he sent two priests, and they taught in Judah, and had the book of the law of the Lord with them, and went about throughout all the cities of Judah and taught the people. Now Jehoshaphat was faithful to God through his whole, whole reign, and there's different reasons for that, but I think one of them is the fact of the emphasis on teaching. You know, in the uh, one of the parables that Jesus told was the parable of the sower. And some of the seeds, you remember, landed on rocky soil. But it started to grow and then it died because it had no roots. And one, there's different ways, but one of the things that helps roots to grow is teaching. So it is possible for people to be excited about God and come to God and know the true God without teaching sometimes it won't last. So the responsibility of teaching is a large one, and we hope to work toward that end through these coming lessons. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you this evening, thanking you for the opportunity we have to gather together. Pray Lord, for this, each one that is here this evening in attendance, that as they learn and share, we might together have a better understanding of how to teach your word. Each of us has responsibilities to others, and the sheep that you've given us, and the charge to feed the sheep is a charge we take, respons take responsible for and do not take lightly. We pray, Lord, for wisdom. We pray for illumination. We pray for the fullness of your Spirit to lead us and guide us, that we might be faithful in teaching the Word, the truth that we have. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Attendance. I think I know everybody, but we won't. We'll see. <coughs> Let's 
see more because they will be. Well, I'm glad you're here, Mark. Nice to have you. Um, besides you, that's Chris, right? Brian. Pardon? Brian. Oh, Brian. Brian. Okay, yes. Dustin. Translated by the English word teach or taught. 
The Hebrew language is a very vivid language. It, it conveys pictures very well. And so as we look at each of these 12 words, we will get a greater scope and a greater depth and insight into what teaching is. The first three words are more accurately related to learning. And I think the title of this course is Teaching and Learning, so I thought that was appropriate to share them first. They're, they are occasionally translated as teach, but generally they refer to learning. And I hesitate to use the Hebrew words because it makes you, that's over logical, but they are so often intermingled with English words of knowledge, understanding, skill, wisdom, that we almost have to use the Hebrew word in order to keep things straight. So forgive me, that's what we will do. The first one is the Hebrew word yadai, and it means knowledge, acquisition of knowledge, facts. It means to know. Its first use in the Bible is in Genesis 3, 5. Now without even looking, can you guess what that reference is? Referring to in Genesis 3, we have the fall. And what was the center of the fall? The tree of knowledge is good and evil. So, right off the bat, we find out that the acquisition of knowledge by man is tainted by evil. He acquired it the wrong way. So, mankind's God given ability to know was infected with an evil virus. So we have to be careful in the acquisition of knowledge and in the teaching of knowledge. It has to be framed within a spiritual framework. You can acquire knowledge in different frameworks and not become wise. People become very smart but lack wisdom. All the information that's available, all the information that we receive, all the information that's taught is always given within a framework, within a, what we some people call a worldview or a bias. It's impossible, I feel, to present or receive knowledge without some type of bias. We have to just recognize what that bias is. One man can look at the fossils in the earth and the layers of rock and come to the conclusion that many years were taking place and that these fossils support evolution. Another man can look at the same facts and say, this shows proof that there was a worldwide flood and buried many, people, many animals at the same time and they died and left fossils. You have the same information, but because of the framework in which the information is received, you come to different conclusions. God's design that was that man would become mighty in spirit. You know, God created man from the dust of the earth, he formed a body, and then he breathed into his nostrils a breath of life, which we call the spirit. And then man became a living soul. So we have a body, we have a soul and a spirit. And God designed that man's spirit would be the ruling factor of his life. He would communicate with God with his spirit. His spirit would rule his soul and body. But because of the fall, because God's man's spirit died, God's design has been corrupted. So God's design was that we'd be mighty in spirit and that our mind, our acquisition of knowledge, part of our soul would come under the dominion of our spirit. I'm going to represent the mind, the triangle, part of the soul. And the world would, would uh, propose that we should approach life with an open mind. So we'll call this an open mind. And what that means is when we confront, we, can, we uh, acquire knowledge without any other um, framework or whatever, but then we acquire knowledge, and then that knowledge will confront our spirit, which I'm going to represent the circle. And depending where we are spiritually, we either have a conflict or a resolution. God's design is that we have a submitted mind. 
and that when we are confronted with knowledge, we will not approach it first with our mind, but we approach it first with our spirit. James talks about their wisdom, which is from above, and they talk about wisdom that is um, earthly, sensual, devilish. Uh, James 3, oh, I think that's just 13. Someone read that before. James 3, 13 through 15. Who is the wise man and do the knowledge among you? Let him show out of his good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. Okay. So the spirit tests the knowledge. And another place talk about testing the spirit. I think that's in the First John, it puts a test of spirit. Then after that, then the mind becomes involved in absorbing the knowledge within the uh, framework of recognizing where this knowledge comes from. Now, do you understand what I'm trying to say? We read a, a magazine or a and it presents a new idea. Well, where does this idea come from? Is it based on this man's logic? Is it based on this man's background? Is it based on right interpretation of Scripture? Is it based on twisting Scripture? And then once we have submitted our, the spiritual aspect of it, then we can, with a submitted, directed mind, examine the knowledge. We do not just cut it off because sometimes we can learn, but we, we learn, we do not come with an open mind, we come with a submitted mind. Okay? When we teach, we must guard against dispensing facts without that godly framework. Um, there's a verse in 2 Timothy where it talks about ever learning and never coming to the light of the truth as a description of some people. We must guard against that in our teaching. We must always framework it within the bigger picture of truth. The second word that's occasionally as a teaching, but more often associated with learning. Usually often translated as um, consider skill, instruct. It would mean to, to be circumspect. It's one step beyond the first word there. Which I spelled wrong. It would be the process of meditating, um, considering, Study is taking the, the knowledge, the facts, and then running them through whatever you do, the process things. And then the third word goes one step further. And it means to understand, but in an understanding in a sense of revelation. Um, I call this the light in the spirit. Um, you know, there is revelation and then there is reason. We come to conclusions, we can reason them out, or we take facts and run through our, our grid work of our experience and our knowledge and come up with a reasonable conclusion. But then there's also revelation where God reveals things to us. Sometimes, Revelation comes without the reason. I mean, sometimes revelation isn't quite fit reason. Sometimes it does, but it's not always. In the 
first use of this word being to understand is in Deuteronomy 113. Um, maybe someone could read that to me. Deuteronomy 113. Take you wise men and understand it, and known among your tribes, and I will make them rulers over you. Okay, wise men and understanding. That understanding is the word we're looking at here. And it's, it's all for one of the qualifications for the leaders of the tribes, the leaders of the children of Israel, was that they'd be men who had gone this far. They had come to the point where they had taken information and considered it and had come to understanding, and come to revelation of it. In um, Nehemiah, Eight, nine. In Nehemiah, which is the Trishatha, and Ezra the priest, Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people said, This day is holy to the Lord your God. More than not are we, for all the people wept when they heard the words of the Lord. That word taught there. Is, trans, is a translation of this word being. Once again, it was more than just dispensing information, it was dispensing spiritual truth to the people. And then there's an interesting, in Daniel chapter 1, let's turn there together, Daniel chapter 1, Daniel and his three friends, well actually, the whole book of Daniel, he uses these words quite frequently, and it's interesting the comparison it makes there. In Daniel 1 verse 7, it says, unto who, speaking of the four young men, the prince of the eunuchs gave names, and it gives their names there. Maybe I should back up and watch them. Verse 17. As these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding and all visions and dreams. All three of these words in this verse. As for these four children, God gave them yada and sackle and all learning and wisdom, and Daniel had him in all visions and dreams. Trying. They had knowledge. God directed knowledge from their training, and they used their minds to be skillful with the knowledge they had. And then Daniel had revelations from God. God had, Daniel had the understanding mentions here then. So then, knowing this, what then is a teacher's responsibility? Um, is it, can a teacher make a student understand? Um, one more verse that I thought was interesting. This, these three words are put together. It's in Daniel chapter 11. It's speaking of a future time. From Daniel's day, and some would contend that that time is now past, some would say it's in the future. That's beside the point for our discussion tonight. In Daniel chapter 11, in verse uh, 32, <clears throat> such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God, that's that first word, Yahweh shall be strong and do exploits, and they that understand, that's the second word, sacral, among the people, shall instruct many. Being is instruct. I'm not quite sure what that all means, but I find it interesting that that is put there. As a teacher, we can present the knowledge within a framework, a spiritual framework, the first yada. And then we can demonstrate by the way we teach and guide the students that we are teaching and how to meditate, consider, understand the knowledge. But the revelation, we cannot give people understanding. They, the light in their spirit has to come from God. So, But as a teacher, we can 
present knowledge, we can present how to use the knowledge, but then we pray that God's Spirit would give illumination. Ephesians chapter 1. Paul prayed for the believers there. And it's appropriate for us to use this prayer today if we pray for believers that we are responsible to teach and unbelievers as well. Ephesians 1, um, verse 16, he says, He ceases not to give thanks to you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. And then he lists three things that he'd like them to know. This here is my goal and hope it's your goal in teaching. That light up moment. I mean, you can sometimes see it when you're teaching, people will be sitting there and all of a sudden the light goes on. And that's, that's, the, that's my goal and I hope it becomes your goal as well to teach. Okay, any questions so far before we transition to the rest of the words? Okay, nine more words. Um, one of the words for teaching, it's in Jeremiah 28, 16, it's translated taught, but it's usually translated as speaking. Um, Genesis 18, 27. Sodom because Lot's there. And Abraham, verse 27, Genesis 18, and Abraham answered and said, Behold, now I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord. That word speak is one of the Hebrew words that's sometimes translated to teach. In Exodus 9 1, we have the same word taught using Moses. Exodus 9 1. And the Lord then said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh and tell him, Thus saith the Lord God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. That word tell there is translated from this word as well. So, the one aspect of teaching is speak. I want you to consider, in Abraham speaking to God, and in Moses' speaking to Pharaoh, Imagine what they did. They didn't just work the first thing that came to their mind. They carefully, I would imagine, if I was Moses, I would write down what I was going to say to get every word right. Um, this speaks of spending time preparing what you want to say. Time spent planning what you say, how you say it, the order you say it, pays off. Um, Proverbs 25 or 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. God's primary way of transferring truth is not <coughs> words. And so, Teaching includes speaking. Um, this might be a, a place to interject the fact that there are speech habits. Some of us have bad speech habits and they could be corrected. Um, repeating certain words all the time or having filler words, filler sounds or, or poor uh, dropping the ends of syllables, or there's all kinds of speech habits that detract unintentionally from a teacher presenting a lesson. I am dismayed at how many educated people use um, 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 over and over, or, or use poor, use 
words that, that don't mean what they wanted to convey. So one aspect of teaching is speaking. Another word we find, uh, Exodus 18 is a story of Jethro visiting Moses in the wilderness. And he notices how Moses spends the morning to the evening listening to the people. And Moses, verse 17, Exodus 18, 17, Moses' father-in-law said to him, The thing that thou doest is not good. Thou wilt surely wear away, both thou and this people that is with thee, for this thing is too heavy for thee. Thou art not able to perform it thyself, but it hearken unto my voice, I will give thee counsel, and God shall be with thee. Be thou for the people to God, that they may bring the causes to God. Thou mayest bring the causes to God, and thou shalt teach the ordinances and laws, and shalt show them the way where they must walk, and the work that they must do. This word here, teach, means enlightening. He, Moses was to help the people understand. He was to teach them ordinances and laws and show them the way where they must walk and show them the work that they must do. To enlighten. Teaching is enlightening. Um, the Hebrew word means to, to glean or to enlighten, especially by warnings. Sometimes this word is translated simply by the word warn. People by nature are unaware of truth and the dangers of missing the truth. And so part of teaching is enlightening people to make them aware of the truth and of the dangers that they ignore the truth. Um, John 8, 12, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you shall not walk in darkness. Psalm 119, 105, thy word is a lamp to my feet, a light to my pathway. God's word brings light, and in teaching, we are to enlighten. We help people in teaching to know which way to go and how to avoid sin. That's what Moses did in here. He was to teach them the way we must walk and the work they must do. Another word for teaching in, in Hebrew is in Deuteronomy 4, verse 9 and 10. Only take heed to thyself, and keep thy soul diligent, lest thou forget all things that thine eyes have seen, lest they depart from thy heart all the ways of thy life, and teach them, thy sons, thy sons' sons, especially today, that thou stood before the Lord thy God in word, which the Lord said to me, gather the people together, and I will make them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days, and they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. In verse 9, the word, um, there's verse 10, I'm sorry. It says, I'll make them hear my words that they may learn. That word learn there and the word teach in the next line are both from the same Hebrew word, which means to go. Now, what does the word go mean? G O A D. Prod. Prod. You take a pointy stick behind it, the slow donkey or the Ox and jam them to, to make them go forward, to prod them. So teaching can sometimes be prodding. <laughs> Notice in these two verses the connection with the fear of the Lord. He says, um, Don't forget what you saw, especially the day. 
when you were at Mount Sinai, that was the day God came down and it was a fearful sight. And he says, I will make them hear my words that they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth and that they may teach their children. Other places this word is used is connected with the fear of God. We want our teaching to move people in a certain direction. Now, as a teacher, do you know what direction you want them to move? Do you know the consequences of rejecting the specific truth that you're teaching? You know, I can teach you a truth, but do I know what happens if you reject that truth? Can I share that with you as a warning? This is the truth, and if you reject this truth, these are the consequences. Back to the parable of the sower. Some of the seed fell on hard soil. This is a picture of hearts that reject the truth. And what happens to that seed? In the parable, what happens to the seed that ended on hard soil? Well, who took it away? The birds took it away. And who did, the bird, who did Jesus say the birds represented? In the, in the explanation of the parable, he says, those who do not receive the word, the devil comes and takes it away. So there's a consequence to rejecting truth. How do we do that? In Jude 22, 23, it says, Some save with compassion, and some as pulling out a fire. So there's not one way to pry people. Some people, compassion works, and some people, fear works. You know, if you had children, you know all about that. There's different ways to prod people. But in teaching, prodding is part, can be part of teaching. Okay, while we're Deuteronomy, we're going to go two more chapters. Deuteronomy 6, where we find another word. Is, this is the only time it's translated teach. Deuteronomy 6, 7. It's speaking about the Israelites who teach their children. It says, Thou shalt teach them diligently to thy children, and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thy house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. That word that is translated one time here as teach is almost always everywhere else translated as sharpen. As in sharpening arrows or sharpening a sword. I find this intriguing. Because there is a verse that likens children to arrows. And here we're supposed to teach, and the word used is sharpen arrows. I don't know what all that comprehends. We can go a long way with that analogy, but we'll just mention that. Um, Proverbs 27, <coughs> 17 talks about sharpening. So a man sharpeneth the countenance of his friend. Teaching can sharpen one another. Um, teach, sharpening can be comprehension of truth. To help someone understand the truth, to sharpen it. Also, um, sharpening can help someone discern good from evil. In Hebrews 5, 14, it talks about they that are mature, be strong, be able to discern between good and evil. Um, this verse, I mean, I like to think it's sharpening children, but technically it says, Thou shalt sharp, thou shalt be able to sharpen, thou shalt teach to them diligently to thy children. So, what is the them in that verse? The commandments of the Lord. We are to sharpen the commandments of the Lord to our children, in this verse, and to our students. Sharpen the words we teach. What we teach should have a point. Make sure your teaching has a point so that it penetrates. 
vague, fuzzy teaching just doesn't penetrate very well. Um, we'll talk about this later, about when we learn how to prepare a lesson, about ways you can make it more pointed. Another word is translated teach is in Psalm 25, verse 12. Psalm 25, 12 says, What man is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. And then two chapters later, later chapter 27, verse 11, the same word as used, where it says, Teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path to cause of mine enemies. Both these verses use the same Hebrew word for teach, and both these words connected with the way. Notice that. Verse 12. 25.12 says, Him shall he teach in the way that he shall choose. 27.11 says, Teach me thy way, O Lord. This word <clears throat> needs pointing. And in other places, it's connected with the way. Pointing the way to go. Um, teaching can be pointing. Proverb contains over 50 verses speaking of the way that we go. Jesus talked about two ways. The broad way and the narrow way. Teachers of the Bible point people to the narrow way, the way of life. When we point, we are, point, we are pointing the way we are going, not to where we are going. So what does that say about the teacher? The teacher is going with the students. The teacher does not stand on a plateau and tell the people, the students, come to where I am. Sometimes the teacher is above the students, but sometimes the teacher is with the students, pointing the way that we should go. Connecting with the students in that way. Good teaching will at times direct students ahead of the teacher. It, it takes a really good teacher to do this. But some teachers are able to open the door enough so you can see something and they can actually direct students that have spiritual understanding ahead of themselves. And that, that's a, a goal for a teacher but it's also a stumbling block for many people because um, I observe that there are some people who do resent it when those that are teaching become better than themselves. But we, we should be, our spirit should be that I want to take what I have learned and give it to you and push you so you go further than I have gone. That's a spirit we should have. But that takes humility. And it seems like sometimes humility is a hard thing for you to to hang with. In Ephesians chapter 4, <coughs> Paul says that God has gifted certain men in the church to lead the church. Evangelists, teachers is one of those. Ephesians 4, verse 12. He gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers. And the reason for this gifting of these leaders is for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And then notice the change in the personal pronoun. Till we all come. to the unity of the faith. The teachers, pastors, apostles, evangelists are not working to edify the church so they come to where they are. It's till we come together. We are, we are working to come to the unity of the faith. We are leading them on, pointing them to the way we should both together go. Okay, another word that 
is translated teach, it's um, it was used by Elihu, the arrogant young man who spoke to Job. He told Job that I will teach thee wisdom. It is translated as learn in Proverbs 22, 25. Lest thou learn his ways, watch it back up. Verse 24, make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways, and get it a snare in the end. This word has the meaning of exemplifying. Being an example. Identifying is a big word, but I'm trying to get words all in 9G. That's, I couldn't think of being an example in, didn't sound quite right grammar, grammatically. So, exemplifying is being an example. Teaching can be and should be being an example. We cannot be a successful teacher if our walk doesn't match our talk. What do you call people whose walk does not match our talk? Hypocrite. Hypocrites, exactly. I don't know if this is true or not, but it's possible that hypocrisy may be the main reason that truth is not passed on to the next generation. In Deuteronomy 6, <clears throat> verse referred to earlier, where they were to teach their children, the verse right before that says, put these words and commandments in your heart. Then it says, and teach your children. So the parents, the teachers, have to have the truth in their lives to effectively teach. Now that doesn't say that if a person doesn't have the truth in their life, their teaching is totally unacceptable and worthless. I mean, God uses a donkey to teach a man sometimes. So he can use all kinds of ways to teach us. But if we want to be an effective teacher, we must strive to have our walk match our talk. Another word, Proverbs 31, 1, that's translated teach, another different Hebrew word. In this verse it says, the words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him. This word means to correct or to chastise. In fact, it is, it is translated as correct in Proverbs 29, 17, where it says, Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. So another aspect of teaching is correcting. James 5.20 
talks about he that speaketh in an unknown tongue. I said, notice that that unknown is in italics. What that means is the translators added that word to help us make sense of it. I said, every time the tongues are spoken of in the New Testament, they were known languages. And I went through the chapter, and every place where it talks about the unknown tongue, the unknown is in italics. I said, the, the, the speaking in tongues that, that you're seeking after isn't what the Bible teaches. They were very quiet. They didn't have no response. Um, they eventually left the church. Because when you start a path, a wrong path, it, it leads in a certain direction. But part of teaching is correcting. As you teach, do you know the error of your students that need correcting? Do you need to know the error of your students? <laughs> there are, well, I'll just let's stop there. Do we need to know the error of our students or to correct them? No, no. the Spirit knows. Okay. Yeah, as we don't, as, as we teach or give a message, we don't always know all the needs of the congregation or the class. But God's Spirit can take what we say right. to a soul that is open. There's also universal errors. If you are honest and know your own heart, you know your errors. And as you correct them, you will, I mean, there's universal errors that all people are subject to. And that speaking the truth will, will help correct them. Two more. Hosea 11.3. This is the only time this word is used. It's translated and teach. <coughs> God says, I taught Ephraim also to go, taking them by the arms, but they knew not that I healed them. This word means guiding. In the book of Acts, we read the story of Philip. God told him to go into a certain place and join himself to this man riding in his chariot. And so he went up, and the man was reading from the book of Isaiah. And Philip says, do you understand what you're reading? And the man says, how? And that some man would guide you. That's not the word to use, but that was the essence of his request. And so Philip joined the chariot, and Philip guided him in understanding the truth. So another aspect of teaching is guiding, helping to walk. Teacher has understanding. We are to pass it on to others. Whether it's teaching a child how to tie their shoes, or whether it's expounding on the mysteries of the book of Revelation, we, are, we can guide students in the truth. The last Hebrew word is translated teach is also used once. The second part was 35, 1 to 3. And it's actually a form of this word, just a variation of that word there. And that's where we're going to close this session. Because our goal in teaching is, is that right there. Whether we're speaking precise words, or rather enlightening a person's mind, whether we're prodding them forward, or sharpening their thinking, or pointing them in the direction to go, or exemplifying more in life, the truth, or correcting errors in life, or guiding them to understand. The ultimate goal is understanding in the spirit, light in the spirit, because it is light that gives light. It is light that God wants us to live in. Now we notice various aspects and pictures of teaching. Why are there so many different ways to teach and different objectives of teaching? Because there are different needs. There are different needs. People learn differently. Some students speaking the truth, it sinks in their heart. Others need to be prodded. Others need to be have an example. Other people need special guidance. There's different ways of teaching. There's different needs of people. People learn differently. 
There are different lessons to be taught. All the truths in the Bible do not fit in one, one picture there. Some lessons are spoken, some lessons are exemplified, some lessons are, are, are pointed forward to. And one thing I want to leave with you, and then we'll click, I have a break. Teaching is student-oriented, not lesson-oriented. It is more important to get through to the student than it is to get through the lesson. I know that, I believe that, but I, I want to do my lesson. <laughs> it's, it's so much, it's hard to keep our focus set. But our focus, it should be students. So, I mean, it's better to run out of time and have the students understand the first half of the lesson than it is to get through the lesson and lose your students. Okay, have a break. What, ten, five, ten minutes? Whatever, please start saying it. Okay. Here it is. God's love to me is as real as the day. Plainly I feel it now showing the way. It is as real as my pleasures or pain. Real as the sunshine.
I'll, I'll have to be honest with you, Leon. We had this book assigned for another class in the past. I didn't reread it for this class. That's, That's exactly why I assigned it, because I knew most people would, something would still happen. So. Yeah. Uh, first of all, the idea that teaching the Bible is bridging, building a bridge. There's also a book by Sean Stott on that concept. And in this book, the authors talk about first making a journey back to the world of the text and then making another journey back with that into the present. Um, I think it's easier for us to stay in one or the other of those two worlds, either to go back and examine the text and talk about what it meant then and all of the details of that, or to talk about what, what we think is in contemporary application but really to teach the Bible is to go back to that world and then bring that lesson back into our world. Second, the emphasis on the unity of the Bible is something else that I, it's been impressed on me, and especially in, ex, in expository teaching, understanding that it all fits together, it all goes together, and also that everything has a context. Every passage has a context, and the meaning of this passage is in unity with the meanings around it. Um, it's very easy to take one little section and go through it and look at every tree in there and forget that those trees are part of a larger forest of trees and not to see how they all fit together. The third, and this is something that I have really benefited from a lot in the past year or so, the different literary types that are in Scripture, and that not everything is interpreted in the same way because not everything is the same literary genre. So that if I'm reading poetry, poetry it deals with images and figures, and sometimes they're exaggerated just to make the point. And so I interpret poetry different than historical narrative. Um, one of the authors of this book, I think, is Leland Reichen, and he is the editor of, an e of the ESV Literary Study Bible, which has been really helpful to me in the past year, just the insights as far as the literary types of the different passages, and then handling God's word properly, understanding those distinctions in the literary types, and interpreting them differently because of the different literary genres. Thank you. That was very well put. Did anyone take the seven laws of teaching with John Gregory? I'd like to share a couple things they learned from that. Okay, Fred? I think some other people might have read it too. But I was great to share a couple things he benefited from that and share with the class. Still working on reading it. I think I'm a little over halfway through. It's an older book, and it was written in the late 1800s. And of course, the seven laws of teaching. He lists those in the book. And I'll go over those seven here quickly, sort of in my own words. No further the, the lesson you plan to teach. That's number one. Number two, gain and keep the attention of pupils. Number three, the language of teaching must be understood by the student, and it must be language clear and understood by both the student and the teacher. Number four, start teaching what the student already knows with single, easy, natural steps. Let the known explain the unknown. Number five, is stimulate the student's mind to attention. Teach in a way that the student anticipates your next truth. Number six, require the student to think about the lesson they learn. This should allow the student to express the lesson in his own words. Number seven, the information presented must be thoroughly reviewed by applying new truths and correcting any false <coughs> views. A couple statements in that book that really stuck out to me. These are the ones that I saw so far. The first object of teaching is to stimulate the pupil or student to love of learning and to help the student study on their own. Another thing was complete mastery of a few things is better than an ineffective smattering of many. Also, make the presentation so interesting that the attention of pupils will follow it. 
And this last thing you have right now refers to uh, the third law. The language and teaching must be understood by the student. The language, language must be common to both teacher and learner. Use illustrations, objects, pictures, or experiences to help with the meaning of new words. Too many words can be harmful. Use less words that are simple to understand. Thank you, Ray. And anybody uh, use or prepare your learning messages by heart? Randy? Just want to encourage you if anybody hasn't read this book, it's a it's a small book and it's a gem. I think it's probably the third time I've been through this book. I probably should have picked some other ones, but this is a good one. Um, <clears throat> teaching is defined by Harold Martin as, as proclaiming Bible truths with the primary goal of instructing the mind and a secondary goal of moving the will. So it's mind first and then will. And preaching is proclaiming Bible truths with the primary goal of moving the will first and then second there, the goal of instructing the mind. So the, so the point of how we teach or preach are two different aspects. So, um, and, and one of the important verses I think Harold uses is 2 Timothy 4.2, and this is the RSV version of it, and I, that's what he chose, but it says, preach the word, be urgent in season and out of season. I think one of the main goals we need to remember, especially as we get older and we do it more, is the urgency that we need to keep in order to expound and teach those that we're preaching to. So that's one good point. The second point is the commitment of time. How much time do we spend? The, and how writes this, the, the price for each preacher or teacher, um, the price to pay, is that time and study for the privilege of standing before an audience and uh, proclaiming God's word. Uh, he says that it needs to be meaningful. We must work hard, long, and diligent in our studies uh, to be able to teach a good lesson. And I think that the, one of the third points that is very important that I think we can overlook is our introduction. And this goes as far as a message. I guess it could be for teaching also, but the introduction is, is important because the audience gains an impression of, of who we are, of, of the speaker. And it, if we come across prepared, friendly, they're much quicker to listen to what we have to say and accept that versus if we are unprepared, come across as unfriendly, they're quicker to maybe turn the volume down to their mind and their hearts a little bit and sort of not pay attention to us as quickly. So that's the, the three points that, there's many points, but that's the three that I have for this evening. Thank you, that was very well. Um, so, so I don't forget, if you want to pass in the center, put them right here in front of Dustin on the bench and I can pick them off the way home. How many of you have ever read the book by Watchman Lee, The Spiritual Man? Anybody? Okay. It's a huge volume. And in, in, uh, in it he spells out different aspects of the spiritual man. But one of the things I thought was interesting is uh, I was in the introduction at the end and he says he almost wishes he hadn't written it because it, it, it gives a sense of completeness that this is all there is to know about the spiritual man. He said the spiritual world is never completely understood. There's always that aspect of it that we don't quite comprehend. And so as we talk tonight, the next year, about the role of the Spirit in teaching, it's going to perhaps appear as random thoughts that I just share with you, and perhaps it is just random thoughts, but um, it's not easy 
to make a completeness in, in we close in talking to them about the spirit. So we'll just start to go through what you get here. Okay, the Bible, first of all, we must understand the Bible is written under the direction of the Holy Spirit. 2 Timothy 3.16 says that the word of God is inspired. 2 Peter 1, 20, says that the holy men of God wrote as they were moved by the Spirit. So the Spirit <clears throat> understands the Word. He's the one that put it down. 1 Corinthians 2. Let me turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. There's some important things to learn here. Uh, verse 11, he says, For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. So we need the Spirit of God to teach us so that we can teach others. <laughs> and in verse 12 he says, Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things we speak. In John 14, Jesus promised his disciples that he would send them the Holy Spirit. And one thing that he would do would help them understand. He would teach them so that they would be able to understand the truth. We teach others. <laughs> I apologize for using the green the first time. I just... Okay, what was first there? I didn't think it through, but this might be show better. We need to teach our spirit to a student's spirit. That is different than teaching our mind to their minds. Um, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13 says, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. No matter how mature you are, there are still deficiencies in your mind. There are dark spots. There are areas where you are deceived and not know the whole truth. And so if you teach from your mind to their mind, you will pass that along to your students. That's why we need to teach spirit to spirit. 1 Timothy 2.4 God's will that all men will be saved and come under the knowledge of the truth. And this contrasts the second of the 3-7, which we already mentioned, of men who are ever learning and never come to the knowledge of the truth. Now the next assignment for the next time is that you choose a verse or part of a verse and share the truth in that passage and then anchor it within a framework of spiritual worldview. Now, I didn't quite know how to define it, so I'm going to give you examples of what I'm looking for to help you better understand your assignment, okay? Um, I took Revelation 20, verse 1. I'll just read the verse. Revelation 20, verse 1 says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, hanging the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. Okay, I'll give you three examples of teaching this verse. The first example was one I actually heard as I sat in the Sunday school class in another church. Okay? The teacher stood up, he read the verse, and this is what he said. He said, there's no angel as strong as a devil, so I don't know how this angel bound this devil, so I think this must be really Jesus here. And he used a great chain, and when I think of a great chain, I think of the chain we used to have on the farm. We used to we use it to pull stumps out, and we got stuck in the mud, we would use it to pull each other out. And that's what I think of, I think a great chain. And then it, it talks about this bottomless pit here. When I think of a bottomless pit, I think, well, how can you have a bottomless pit? There's no bottom. How can you have such a thing? You fall forever. Do you see the, the fault there? How often did he say, I think? Okay? That's one <coughs> I don't want to uh, excite like that. <laughs> Another one that's a little better, but still not quite 
reaching what we should strive for is the teacher who dispenses all facts. Okay? He looks at this verse and he says, I saw an angel. The Bible talks about angels a lot. In fact, in Revelation, angels are mentioned more times than any other book. Angels' purpose in Hebrews 1.14 is to minister to the saints. And in Revelation, the angels administer judgment. And in a way, that's ministering to the saints. Judgment to the wicked, wicked is in a sense ministry to the saints. This angel is given a key. Two times in the book of Revelation, we read this key. One time in chapter 9 where the pit is open, and this where the pit is closed. The bottomless pit here comes from the Greek word abyss, and it's used seven times in the book of Revelation. In Luke 8 31, the abyss is translated to deep. The demons did not want to be cast into the deep, they wanted to go into the swan. Okay, it, it was okay, but there was no framework to hang for that around, okay? Now, I should say there's no right and wrong answer for this assignment, okay? There's a lot of latitude here. But just want to give, give you a sense of taking the truth and anchoring with a spiritual framework. This is how, this is an example of a better way to teach this verse. One of the main themes of the book of Revelation is victory over evil. Here, we see the source of evil being bound. But it's bound by an angel. Why an angel? And how? By an angel. You must understand there is power and there is authority. Even though Satan has more power than an angel, the angel had God's power and authority to bind him. That's why we can have victory over Satan, because Christ has all power and authority. Christ's Spirit lives in us. 1 John 4 4 talks about greater sin is in you than he that is in the world. As we submit to Christ, His power will work through us. But power is only part of the picture. It's also timing. In Acts 1 7, Jesus says the times and seasons are in the hands of the Father. At the present time, Satan is allowed to work. At some future time, God will say, Stop. It doesn't have to be long, but do you see what I'm trying to, to say? Okay, that's what we're looking for your son. Okay. Spirit to spirit. Okay, next up, I'll verse In Mark chapter 2, Jesus is uh, teaching the people. And uh, some people brought a man of sick with They couldn't get in for the crowd. So they climbed up on the roof, made a hole, let the man down in. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the sick of palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts. Why did this man speak blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God only? They didn't say a word out loud. They reasoned in their hearts. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit, that they so reason within themselves. He said to them, Why reason ye thus think these things in your hearts? Whether it's easier to say, he goes on them to answer their questions. How did Jesus know when they didn't say it out loud? You can say, well, he was God. He knows everything. Well, he was also man. We use the word perception. Perception means insight. It means intuition. Intuition is knowing without conscious reasoning. There's different means of intuition, but as a believer in Christ, our intuition will come to us by the Holy Spirit. We have the same spirit that Christ had. And so, I believe we also have the ability to sometimes perceive things, even without obvious conscious reasoning. The ability to perceive questions. Jesus perceived without them asking, they had questions. 
as a teacher, it is helpful if we can perceive. You know, people have questions, but they won't always express them. Can you perceive the question and answer that question? Um, in Mark, Matthew 16, 8, Jesus perceives something different than the question. Jesus said that this is a page uh, 16, 6. Jesus said that take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sanctions. They reason among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread. Which, when Jesus perceived, he said to them, O ye of little faith, why reason you among yourselves because you brought no bread? Don't you understand? Either remember the five loaves and the five fishes? He perceived their false reasoning. There's different examples in the Gospels where Jesus perceived people's false reasoning and he went on to refute that and give them the truth to refute false reasoning by the Spirit's help. In Matthew 22, Jesus perceived people's motives. Matthew 22, verse... Um, 17, they asked Jesus, they said, Tell us therefore, what thinkest thou? Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? But Jesus perceived their wickedness and said, Why tempt ye me, ye hypocrites? They didn't. They posed themselves as an innocent question. But Jesus perceived that there was something behind this question. This is also a good characteristic. Some students are not <coughs> good students. <laughs> Some people will sit in your class with the intent to trip you up uh, or make trouble. And they, they will learn to ask questions that appear innocent. We need to learn to perceive sometimes motives behind questions and not answer the question directly, but answer the, like Jesus did. He didn't answer the question yes or no. You notice that? He went deeper. To that. Now, how do we get perception? How do we develop perception? Does anybody have any ideas? One is your faces. As you teach, you, you face people. Okay, if you're if you're down here all the time, you don't want to see people's faces. But a lot can be learned from people's faces. Questions. Motives. But then I think there's also, I, I, I can't quite explain it. Some people are better at this than others. They can just sense things. We had seven children, and two of my daughters had a very developed sense of perception. I would, we milk cows, and they would take turns helping me, so I, I had time with my children one on one. That's great. But two of my daughters, they would come in the morning, what's wrong, Daddy? I didn't see anything. But they could sense, they all, and sometimes they almost could read my thoughts, almost scared. They just had this, and some people seem to have a better ability to perceive. So I'm not sure if it's a gift, or if it's developed, or what. But I think it's important to recognize that one aspect of spiritual teaching is, is perception. Um, opening eyes. We're talking about spiritual eyes here. I assume we understand it. God has called us as teachers, preachers, to open people's eyes. Acts 26, Paul's testimony. God's purpose upon his life was to open people's eyes. Acts 26, this is his testimony before um, maybe Felix or Festus, I'm not sure which one, but verse 18, verse 17, well, 16. God appeared to me and he said, Rise, stand upon thy feet, for I appear to thee for this purpose, 
to make thee a minister and a witness both of those things which I have seen and of those things in which I have appeared to thee, delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles to whom now I send thee, to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive the forgiveness of sins. We are to teach, to illuminate, to open people's eyes. This applies to those who are not believers. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 4. Paul says that unbelievers are blinded. Uh, he says, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world have blinded the minds of they, them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, whose image of God should shine upon them. So we are to teach to open the eyes of those that are lost, to open the eyes of those that are believers. The verse I spoke of earlier, Ephesians 1.18, Paul prayed that God and the Spirit would illuminate them, open the eyes of understanding, as they can understand the truth. Also, those that are in sin, a person who has sinned and does not recognize it is blinded to his sin. 1 John 2, verse 11, He that hated his brother is in darkness and walk in the darkness and knoweth not where he goes because darkness has blinded his eyes. So as we teach, we're teaching to open eyes. The best teacher in the world will have no effect if the teacher can't see. I mean, if the student can't see. You can expel the truth to the greatest like Jesus did. But if the student can't see, it won't have any effect. John chapter 12, verse 37, Jesus said, Though Jesus had done so many miracles, yet they believed not on him. That the same Isaiah the prophet may be fulfilled, which he spake, the Lord who had believed in the report, to whom that the honor of the Lord be revealed. Therefore they could not believe, because Isaiah said again, He had blinded their eyes, heart of their heart, they should not see with their eyes, nor understand their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. We need to pray for illumination. When you teach, you pray that God help you teach, and then you pray that God will open the eyes of your students. Our teaching by the Holy Spirit will be Christ-centered. When Jesus spoke to the disciples in the upper room about the coming of the Spirit, he said that the Spirit would teach of Him. John 16, verse 13. How may when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth, for He shall not speak of Himself. Whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. He shall glorify Me, for He shall receive of Mine and show to you all things that the Father of half or Mine. That's all Father would care. He will glorify Me. For he shall receive of mine and shall show it to you. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, <clears throat> verse 1. And I, brother, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring the testimony of God, for I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Why? Because he says. And my speech and my preaching was not the enticing words of men's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. We do not want our students to stand in the wisdom of our words, because they will fall. We want our students to stand in the truth of God and the Spirit, so that they will not fall. Jeff mentioned that the, the Bible is unity. The Old Testament is full of pictures and, foresh and uh, foreshadows of Jesus Christ. In Luke 24, this, this, I just wish, this verse is so great. In Luke 24, Jesus speaks to the two disciples of the Manus Road. And he says, he, oh, no, I'll better read it. It's more effective. I'll get word for you. Luke 24. Verse 27. 
And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I wish I could have been there. Just, and we get tastes of that once in a while, of the different things in the Old Testament that point to Christ. But the Old Testament is a picture of Christ. The Gospels gives us the life of Christ, the doctrine of Christ. The epistles, the doctrine of Christ is expounded. Everything should center around Christ. This is one of the differences between Anabaptism and Protestantism. Anabaptists begin with Jesus has called us to follow Him. And then everything else goes around that. The Protestants begin with we are saved by grace alone. That's their center. And then everything comes around that. Now there's many overlaps in that truth. But you end up in a different conclusion when you start from a different place. That's a whole other subject. Um, if you have the opportunity and the time when you teach a lesson, if you can incorporate all three, the Old Testament as a picture, the life of Christ as an example, and the epistles as an explanation, it makes a powerful lesson. For example, teaching on baptism. The Old Testament, the flood, is a picture of baptism. There's your picture, your analogy, the old world, new world, salvation through um, Jesus was baptized. He's our example. In 1 Peter 3.21, it talks about baptism for the remission of sins and the answer of good conscience together. If you tie those together, you can, you can build a, a powerful lesson. The idea of fruitfulness. In John 15, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. You bear fruit, you must, bear, must be in me. You can go to the Old Testament. and the promised land, one of the aspects of the promised land was the fruitfulness of it. You go to the epistles, you have Galatians chapter 5, where the fruit of the Spirit. And so you can tie them together and, and, and bind them together and make a powerful lesson with a Christ centered thing. Um, Hebrews 4.12. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow. And is a discern of the thoughts and intents of the heart. There are times when the spiritual aspect of teaching is pierced. Because the word is inspired, it is alive. The word here, the word of God is quick. That quick is an old English word meaning alive. We don't use it that way very often. Um, perhaps you heard the quick of your nail. That's the part that's attached to your finger and it's alive and it really hurts when you tear your finger down to the quick. Well, that's what that quick means. The Word of God is alive. But it also is sharper than any two-edged sword. Now, Ephesians says that the Word of God is a, a sword, a weapon against Satan. But this is sharper than a two-edged sword. This is not speaking of, being, of using the Word of God as a sword. That is allowable in fighting Satan. But it is damaging in teaching students of the, of the truth. When we teach the Word to believers, we, it is not as effective to use the Word of God as a sword. It is more effective to use it as a scalpel. Sharpened two-edged sword. Scalpel. Think of that. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. A person who uses a scalpel is very careful how they divide the joints and marrow of the soul and the spirit. We must, by the Spirit's help and guidance, distinguish between the mind, the feeling, and the will, and the spiritual aspect of people and of truth. Many people find it hard to distinguish between emotions and the spirit moving in their life. But there is, there is a dividing line there. Many people find it hard to distinguish between their mind, which is part of their soul, and spiritual truth. That is part of the spiritual aspect of teaching. According to root issues, so much of our life and our talk is spent on the surface, and nothing happens. To get true change of heart, we have to get to the root issues of the problems. 
And that is impossible to do in our own logical reasoning. Because we need the Spirit of God to get to the root issue and to deal with the root issue and to share the root issue. Because real change starts inside going out. As Randy said, God knows our needs. God can read our mind. And He can individualize a lesson to each student. You teach a lesson and God can take something that might not be a major point of that lesson and drive it home to the student that is willing to be taught. We need to be willing to teach. 2 Corinthians 3.18 But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image, from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. A person who is living in the Spirit will be changed. That is what the Bible talks about when it means Sanctification. Sanctification is changing. In Romans 8, it talks about being conformed to the image of Christ. Since none of us look like Christ, all of us have a, have a process that needs to happen, being transformed. One of their goals is spiritual teaching comes as we behold the glory of the Lord. A teacher should teach so the students do not see the teacher, but see the, the Spirit and the God that is behind the teacher. To see God's glory. God does not fit in any kind of box that we construct. Whatever we share and teach is just a small aspect of God's glory. We are changed into His image. We are changed by the Spirit. And then finally, I have the word here, wonder. We live in a world that no longer, we've seen it all, we've done it all, we've experienced it all. There's not much wonder left in the world. A small child still has wonder. And I think that's sad. We have lost the sense of wonder. We should never lose sight of the mystery and wonder of the Spirit and His working. When you teach a lesson, with every question answered, every T crossed, every I dotted, you do not convey that there is much we don't understand. It is not sinful to admit, I don't understand this. This is what the Bible teaches. I understand this much of it, but I know there's this much more. It gives your students a sense that there is a lot more that can be learned and taught. Teaching should convey a sense of the wonder of the Spirit. Even the great theologian Paul, who understood so much and wrote 11 chapters in the book of Romans, laying out logically the doctrine of the righteousness of God, ends with these words in Romans 11.33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Who hath been his counselor? Who hath first given him that should be recognized to him again? For of him and through him and to him and are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Any questions? I want to end with a quote from A.W. Tozer. Sound biblical exposition is an imperative must in the church of the living God. Without it, no church can be a New Testament church in any strict meaning of that term. But exposition may be carried on in such a way as to leave hearers devoid of any true spiritual nourishment, whatever. For it is not mere words that nourish the soul, but God Himself. And unless and until the hearers find God in personal experience, they are not the better for having heard the truth. The Bible is not an end in itself, but a means to bring men to an intimate and satisfying knowledge of God. Let us stand for closing prayer. I'm going to ask the brother Luther if he needs us. Pray that he 
each of us as we have been listening, taking notes. Lord, help us to have glean, a glean, a better picture of where we need to go, how we need to teach. We pray for a fresh infilling of your Holy Spirit in each of our lives. Father, there's a lot of students that we need to see their eyes and perceive. We pray for that enabling power. Be with us now as we travel. Thank you for your mercies, your love. Help us to be encouraged that we might go out and fulfill the calling that you have given to each one of us. Lord, we worship you. We give you praise. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. Thank you.